Hello and welcome to the New Schools Podcast. In today's episode, Shannon speaks with Anne Olderog. Anne and her husband are founders of Acton Academy Verona in New Jersey. Anne is also a partner at a brand consulting firm called Vivaldi, where she leads projects on growth, innovation, strategy, positioning, and brand architecture. Anne holds an MBA from the Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania, a Master's in International Studies from the Lauder Institute at University of Pennsylvania, as well as a Master's in Management from Cambridge University. She is fluent in six languages and has consulted major corporations in the US, UK, France, Germany, and Italy. Anne has a wide range of expertise and experience in education, and this conversation helps shed some light on the key elements of new schools like Acton. We often hear that one of these new schools is learner-centered, or that the learning is passion-led, and this conversation helps reveal what that really looks like. Today we'll hear all about the students at Acton Verona and what makes their education so exciting and engaging. Shannon and Anne are both founders of new schools. They're also both parents and the conversation includes some great insights and strategies there too. This is a conversation that we all found inspiring and we're hoping that it does the same for you. Now here's your host, Shannon Falkenstein, speaking with Anne Olderog. So Anne, we have kind of envisioned this podcast um, to be for an audience of people who are, you know, when, when you were like, I right. can't do this anymore. And I just, school is like not really doing it for me and I need to find an alternative, but I don't know what to do. And we feel like there's so many people in that position right now and it's increasing and of course, COVID has added a huge pressure to that. And so um, we, we kind of want to you know, greet and accompany those people like you're in the right place and that we were all there and we got to that precipice and where we were like, I don't know what to do, but I can't do this anymore. And then we took the leap. And so kind of like, that's where I love to begin is like, what is your origin story prior to the big call to adventure when you went on the journey to do something different than the traditional educational system. Great. Thank you so much. Great speaking to you today, Shannon. So um, our daughter, who is now 12 years old, is a pretty self-directed learner. She is a very spunky child. And generally, she kind of is one of those go-getter children. She is a self-starter. She knows what she wants to do. And you can tell her what she needs to do. She needs to decide it for herself. So she was thriving in Montessori. And then for elementary, she was going to a bilingual school that was French American. And uh, it was a pretty structured and traditional environment. And while she was bilingual in French, we saw the light slowly go out of her eyes. And I saw firsthand the transformation from a child who was spunky and excited and outgoing to a child who was becoming increasingly shy. And over time, once we saw just the, the glaze in her eyes, there was sort of like a cloud over her eyes and she was really sad and I couldn't recognize her anymore. So while as a mother, I was worried about how she felt, also as a professional, I felt like the school wasn't really preparing our children not just for the jobs that will be there tomorrow, but not even for the jobs that we have today. And in our environment, it, you know, just um, executing is not enough anymore. You really need to have creative ideas and you need to be able to build a following. You need to be able to convince others and bring them along with your ideas. And those are really the jobs that we already have today. So tomorrow, we don't even know what jobs we're going to have. We don't know what technical skills would be useful. So the best thing we could do for our children is equip them with meta skills uh, that will enable them to be great with people, be great leaders, create followings, articulate their ideas, and ultimately be lifelong learners. And one of the things that was really important for my husband and I was really this very intimate relationship with learning. We've loved studying and 
all throughout our lives, we've enjoyed learning and challenge ourselves to learn something new, hopefully every day, but definitely throughout our lives. And it was very sad to us that our daughter didn't seem to pick up on that. And to her, studying was really something that she had to do rather than she really wanted to do. And uh, we really wanted her to, um, to be a very engaged, lifelong learner. So my husband went to business school and studied under Jeff Sandifer. Um, uh, who is the founder of Acton Academy, the original one, uh, created a very revolutionary model. He, Jeff was very influential over my husband's thinking generally in, in business and, and in life. So when, when my husband learned that Jeff Sandifer had created this model for his children, obviously this is something that he wanted to have a look at. And once he had an opportunity to visit, he came back and said to me, you won't imagine how these kids are. This is better than our wildest dreams for our children. And it's unfathomable to imagine that this would be out there and our children would not benefit. At the time, there was no Acton Academy in New Jersey. We were one of the first 25 schools. And so at the time, there were definitely already quite a few schools throughout the nation, but not in our state. And so, of course, Jeff's advice in uh, the entrepreneurial MBA class was if something doesn't exist and you feel there is a need for it and you need it, then go ahead and create it. And so my husband and, and I embarked on this very crazy and mad and wonderful adventure of actually starting a new school. And little did we know where this adventure would take us. <laughs> wow, that is great. I feel like your experience is so similar to many other Acton owners. Um, it really resonates with me what you said about really being a learner and loving learning and then seeing your own child like that you believed was just going to be on fire with learning is frustrated and their mood goes down and thinking, whoa, wait a minute. No, we're, we're going down the wrong path here. We have to do something else. Um, tell me, tell me when was that like, so your husband comes home, Kai comes home and he's like, there's this amazing new model. I find often there's like one part person in the couple who's the very like, let's do this and take a risk. And then the other one is usually like, wait a minute, put the brakes on. I'm not sure about this. Did you have that same kind of dynamic in your relationship? Yeah, it's fascinating. Well, Kai is really an entrepreneur at heart. So of course he studied entrepreneurship under Jeff. So for him, there is no better call to adventure than the call to create a new business. Yes. So, you know, all fire. And of course I'm the mom, right? So I'm protecting my little chickens. And so I want to make sure they're in a safe environment and everything works out to that for them. I really cannot fathom the idea that something would not work out. So of course I'm really the prudent one generally in all things in our family. And so I had to actually quite a bit of research but I think what really helped me or got me on board is that I happen to do quite a bit of work on uh, education in the education industry in my work as well and I work with education companies helping them stay relevant to today's learners and mm -hmm. craft their strategies for the future and so when I read you know, Laura's book. And as I started diving further and, and reading about Acton with my need to always research any initiative we have, um, I found that those ideas were so much in line with what I was actually working with my clients on, which are these ideas of learning centricity, that ultimately the future of learning will be to give the keys to the learners and that we can never force somebody to learn something if they do not already want it. So essentially we can't teach we can only encourage learning. Mm -hmm. And the ideas of the shift in paradigm from what we call the sage on the stage model, where you have the professor sort of standing up and imparting wisdom, right? Yes. To the model where learning is really personalized, dynamic, and uh, delivered in an engaging and exciting way. Because for today's learners who grew up in social media, I think really the holy grail is that learning needs to be as engaging as social media, or else we lose their attention very quickly to video games, which I'm sure a lot of parents are finding this uh, these days with COVID is the truth. So I, I felt that I was really in a position to be able to assess those ideas also with the lens of the industry. And as I was working with my clients to open their eyes to what the future might entail, uh, the future in the world of education, it would be such a paradox that I wouldn't be able to offer that type of future to my own kids. And that's how we decided to embark and start 
the first acting academy in New Jersey, which ended up being in Verona. Wow. Wow. So I first learned of you because you sent out the blog that you had written for, for Vivaldi Group, where you work. And um, I found the article to be so heartening and inspiring and it really gave me hope it was you I believe it was published like right in the beginning of the pandemic and you know my husband and I were like what is going to happen and this plague and you know everything and then your article was so beautiful about the renaissance coming after the plague historically and clearing this space like a forest burning and then you know having this new field open for something new and um, I loved your article. We translated it into Spanish and sent it out to our community. And um, so I really am grateful to you for writing that because I felt it gave us a nice paradigm to, to vision with. Um, but I also was wondering if in that industry, you find it frustrating or difficult to convince people of shifting the power to the learner because I think there's a lot of resistance you know, it's a really interesting question. Um, and uh, well, first of all, there's disruption going across a number of industries. So I still remember many, many years ago, 10 or 20 years ago, working with clients in the food industry who still felt that health food was a fringe trend and wasn't going to become as mass as it has become. So sure enough, we know from the way change happens that it starts at the fringes and then over time it crosses the chasm, right? And in education, it feels like we are at that time when these sort of changes and trends are crossing the chasm. And this is why, Shannon, you see so many people and so many parents now coming to us, coming to your school, coming to our school asking for answers mm -hmm. and we as educators have to be able to help them ultimately find those answers. So I find that from an industry perspective, our clients mostly are very forward looking, which is so interesting. I feel like maybe five, 10 years ago, these were more discussions that were happening on the fringe, but now all our clients are talking about this. All the colleges and all the schools are thinking about how education is going to happen this fall and a lot of the changes are really going to stay with them. The models are going to change forever. There's almost no way to put the genie back in the bottle. Um, and so I find that in terms of industry, there is a lot of really forward, futuristic, open-minded thinking. But I think you are quite right that this sort of thinking that is already happening in terms of the education companies and especially in ed tech, mm -hmm. haven't necessarily hit the mainstream of school in particular, perhaps in K-12, because I can say that in higher ed, all these discussions are very mainstream already. And so to the parents who are wondering if this is something that is just an intellectual discussion for a couple of smart people who went to business school, I can tell you that these are the sort of discussions that are happening all throughout the industry. And I want to say that there is by and large consensus that these are hitting the ground and are real things. And I think the only question, as we say, is the velocity of change mm -hmm. and how quickly change is going to happen because I don't really hear any more voices that question that these shifts and changes are, are real in the industry. Do, do you agree? Is this something that you see on, on your front as well? I th thank you so much for that insider knowledge. I'm in a little bit different of a, um, of a culture. And you had mentioned earlier about your daughter being in a French system. Um, and, you know, I'm living in, in Latin America, in El Salvador, and those, you know, the sort of British school, French school, American school, international school systems are very strong here. And it's a very conservative environment. Um, and it's maybe sort of a protective protected culture. So I don't actually hear as much of that happening. Mm -hmm. um, on the ground here, but I know globally I hear it happening. So yeah. I, I really appreciate the insider perspective on that. And I think that's going to be reassuring for a lot of people that are considering a different model. Um, and talking about ed tech, um, Seth Godin has been talking, you know, he's come out and talked a few times about Acton and most recently um, much more strongly about Acton and praising it. Um, and uh, several months ago when the pandemic first started, he wrote one of his famous daily blog posts and he talked about how um, essentially meetings are boring 
and school is an eight hour meeting that's boring. And now that meetings are moving on to Zoom, they're even more boring. And now that school is moving on to Zoom, there it's even more boring. And that now because you're in your home and you're only connecting through the screen, you have the option to check out. And so he was talking about how they're looking at technology that can actually read the face or understand when someone is engaged and then tie it to complying to the system. And that that was possibly a very real danger um, in this, especially K through 12 system. And he was encouraging people to come up with like a whole nother model, which is the model that you and I are talking about and that Acton is doing, which is actually truly engaging children and have them be interested in what's happening rather than forcing compliance. So I wanted to kind of talk to you about that. Yeah, no, I think it is so interesting. So yeah, definitely love Seth and his thinking. And I think that's quite right that there are these two paradigms in the workplace as well, right? There is the boring meetings and there is the reinvention of the meetings. Now in the workplace, a lot of the work that we do happens in collaborative workshops. And so with our clients, even now in, in the COVID environment, we run workshops all the time. And of course they need to be as engaging as possible so that we generate those ideas because again, our job is generate to ideas ideas together with our clients. I want to say together rather than for because that's an important difference. Uh, and so in reinventing the office meeting, there is a lot of creativity that went into that. Our clients are using collaborative tools such as Mural or Miro. They're now, you know, uh, VR is in the space. And so you can create your own avatar and literally go and tap somebody in the shoulder in a virtual uh, workshop. So there is a lot of thinking in the workplace that goes into how do you create a creative environment mm -hmm. and how do you put people in an environment where you can get the best of their thinking and where you can encourage them to have ideas and again it's such a paradox that all this thinking that does exist this body of knowledge that we have as humanity hasn't actually hit the ground in our schools yeah. and so while we are compelled to be our best creative selves every day our children have to go to school and still regurgitate and learn things by heart and recite things back to somebody who is controlling them. So, you know, I think what we're learning from this is that, yes, we can apply knowledge from other industries on how to create, you know, creative environments, create their cultures. Obviously, at ACT and the peer to peer culture is really important. Um, and I think the other thing that is interesting is this notion of control, because control is this very old Victorian notion that we need to somehow, you know, make every put everyone in a box and control the box and then ensure that they comply with orders that come somebody from a general and then we find out we don't have enough generals to give orders to all the soldiers that we have so i think ultimately we want to educate citizens who are self-sufficient and who can who are equipped to make their own decisions and really contribute to society in a meaningful way as opposed to simply obeying somebody's orders and and again there is a whole body of thinking on how you actually can get this done and so you're quite right that where the education um, uh, category is going also holistically is less control and more engagement and more incentives we did as part of my work just some focus groups with higher ed students and we found that of course they are um, very split attention uh, you know very distracted with all the social media that is at their disposal so there is no professor who is standing behind them, especially in these COVID times, telling them what they need to do. And if we as educators do not provide with an environment that again is as exciting as social media so it can capture their attention, we are truly never able to control them and tell them what they need to do because there are just too many other options to spend time in a different way. And I think that's what we're trying to do at Acton is really we call ourselves game makers, right? Yeah. So, so for us, education really is so exciting in itself that we as adults simply need to step back and let it shine. And, and together with the children design this wonderful game because the world is potentially a game and education can be a game in the best sense of the world. When I say game, I really do not mean edutainment. I do not mean entertainment, but I mean game as playfulness, as an opportunity to explore, as an opportunity to take intellectual risks, as an opportunity to put yourself out of your comfort zone which we know children are really only able to do in a play environment. And we know this from Montessori. 
So for me, it was very eye-opening. I was reading a book on change management in, in, uh, in the corporate world. And even in the corporate world, uh, the, the, uh, today's, from today's cognitive science, we know that we as humans are only able to change when we feel comfortable, that we are accepted, valued, understood, and ultimately almost loved. So, of course, the last part really applies more to our children. But I think if we ask our children to learn and grow, then how important is it to create this sort of environment where they feel understood, accepted, valued, and of course loved, which is exactly the sort of place we try to create at Acton. I love that. I love that. And I think, yeah, so much brain science lately has shown, and the mindfulness movement has been very powerful with this, of showing that you know, when the amygdala is fired and someone feels shame or fear and they have that flight, fight, flight or freeze moment, um, the brain is essentially shut down for higher order thinking. Right. And, and I feel that children in a traditional environment, because of the control that the environment wants to have on them, <clears throat> they use a lot of shame, shaming techniques. And those were things that we just absolutely wanted to get away from because of the long-term damage emotionally. And then also the cognitive damage, because you yeah. can't learn in that kind of an environment very well. You really um, learn. You really can't. It, 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 it kills all creativity. And you know, the other book that I know uh, a lot of us at, uh, in the Acton Network really loved reading, and I know I enjoyed very much, is Alison Skopnik, uh, A Gardener and a Cop. Carpenter. And so from that book, what was really fascinating to me is this insight that, of course, we know from Maria Montessori that the children's brain is a sponge. Uh, well, from Alison Gopnik and her research, children, of course, are some of the most creative beings on earth. Mm -hmm. And yet we spend these very creative years trying to teach them sort of what humanity already knows, right? Which is two plus two which as we all know, they ultimately know. I mean, very few adults non, do not know these basics. So they get there eventually. And yet we are so focused as adults on having our children know what humanity knows already, mm -hmm. as opposed to equipping them to push humanity further through the development of their own ideas and the nurturing of their own creativity. And Alison Gopnik talks about it as the explore st stage of the brain and the exploit stage of the brain. And she says that children are much, much better at exploring, adults are much better at exploiting. And yet in, how, you know, in our current society, the paradigm is almost reversed, where children, we focus all the education, the traditional education is so focused on just having them learn and regurgitate what humanity knows already. And once they become adults, they have to work so hard at cultivating their creativity because otherwise they have no space in the workforce. Right. So once you get this as a paradox, you say, why don't we spend more of education trying to cultivate our, our children's unique creative minds and equipping them to be the leaders of tomorrow? And of course, every mother already knows that her children are so creative. And so what a wonderful opportunity as a mother, not to spend your time stifling this creativity and always having to say, let's sit down and do my homework, you know, <laughs> let's yeah. go practice piano and grammar and much rather allowing them to work with creative projects and express themselves, which enables them to, you know, cultivate their unique potential and ultimately prepares them for their future so much better. Yes, I hear you. And I think you've kind of hit on a, a really, a really um, important crossroads that parents get to, which is where they know, you know, they kind of intuitively know now, like we need to be preparing differently. But then the thought of not mastering grammar or basic arithmetic or memorizing, you know, they're kind of like, but what, you know, but what if my child goes to the birthday party and doesn't know the thing or what, you know, or what's going to happen? Like, you know, parents like kind of have this fear there and it makes them not take the risky choice. Right. And, and so, um, and they feel kind of stuck. So um, what advice would you give to parents in that situation? Yeah, I think it's really interesting. And I definitely understand the mothers and fathers who worry about their children mastering the basics. Uh, and so they say before, you know, we teach them to fly, they need to learn how to walk. 
And, you know, what was interesting is now having my, you know, third child being a toddler is we all know as mothers that when children learn to walk and when they start crawling isn't necessarily indicative of their success, uh, you know, further on in life. And every child has their unique patterns. And ultimately, they all start crawling and they all start walking. And I think all of us with our first child, we are perhaps very focused on ensuring that every milestone is, is met. And then by the time you have your second and your third, you're sort of reassured that the child really gets there, right? Yeah. And so the same with basic skills. I mean, uh, everybody at, at Action absolutely masters the basic skills. So I think there is no question about it because in a mastery model, you don't even get to advance to the next stage before you've demonstrated mastery. So I think on the contrary, children are able to advance at, a, at their own pace. And as a result, children who master the basics faster and not held back, but are really able to progress faster. So it's a model that really works well for those learnings who, for those fast learnings who are, you know, fast on picking up things. And of course, those children who need a little bit of help in a specific area can afford to dive in and, and really get the support they need while at the same time advancing perhaps faster in, in other areas without being held back and certainly without advancing ahead without having mastered the subject. But I think what the action model really does well is stretch children beyond basics, which was really important to me, because the notion that my children would only know the basics from school was somehow deeply unsatisfying. And I think what is truly wonderful is the ability to cultivate that appetite for learning and, you know, the quests that are really engaging in deep dives and can spar deep passions in our learners, you know? In, in our school, we did a quest on ancient Greece. We did a quest on marine biology. We did a quest on Newton's toys, you know, um, helping children apply the laws of physics to create their own toys. All of these really, when they did the architecture quest, they applied math and they learned how to apply equations to building the buildings of their dreams. So they get to really use basic skills, which we know from cognitive science is a much better way to retain because you remember something better if you've actually applied it in real life, as opposed to simply learn in theory. And in doing so, they get to really spark passions and cultivate interests that ultimately might translate into them finding their own calling, something which really allows them to change the world in a profound way that we truly believe each child can do. Because to us, every child who walks through our doors is a genius who has the ability to change the world. And we just hope to support them on that journey. I love that. Thank you. So yeah, you are such a thrill to talk to because your, your level of, of um, the, your reference material and your metaphors and your really deep understanding of the industry of education and also Montessori, like you just, you just are lighting up all the dials. So that's amazing. But, <clears throat> and I would like to, yeah, bring it a little bit more to your school. Tell us more about, you know, how many kids you have, what's your environment like, like, tell us more about your wonderful school, Acton Academy yeah, of Verona. Thank you so much, yes. So we are a wonderful, cherished, beloved micro school by design. So we are a small and supportive environment. Of course, at Acton, we believe that small schools and small communities are the best way to give the reins of education to our children, because in large environments, it just doesn't work that way. Uh, interestingly, John Holt, when he developed the theory of unschooling, he realized very quickly that you could do it in large schools. And he thought at first that you could only do it at home, which is why so many of homeschooling families who come to us mm -hmm. are very aligned with our philosophy because they also are inspired by unschooling. Uh, but John Holt then realized that actually it was possible to achieve the same objectives of giving ownership to learners in very, very small groups. And so we really believe in learning in small groups. So we never want to be big. So we started with a small community of five learners, and now we are growing on and on for it. And I think for next year, we are full and we have a waiting list, which is really exciting, but we still never want to have more than ideally 15 learners in, um, in, uh, in uh, elementary, I know we are a little bit over oversubscribed for next year uh, and have a waiting list. And, uh, and, and also, you know, similarly small groups, perhaps no more than five students for 
um, for, for kindergarten and for um, middle school. Um, so we are a small community. We have wonderful, very engaged families and learners. I am amazed by the creativity of our learners and our families every day. It has been one of the great blessings of my life to get to know the Acton families. Uh, we have children who do absolutely amazing things from creating their own businesses to writing their own music, you know, doing plays, uh, you know, a little girl building doll houses and selling them really incredible things. And we see a similar level of incredible level of discussion and creativity with the families. Um, we have amazing parents who find the time to write poetry and sharing love of poetry with their children, performing with them in live concerts. How cool is that? And of course, involving them in their everyday businesses that will range from, you know, having a doctor's office to, to running a company uh, and to really amazing things. So our learners get together every day and they start with a launch. And that's a Socratic discussion that really puts them in the shoes of the great decision makers of all times. And they have to face ethical dilemmas that they have to, that they're compelled to resolve. And in doing so, they have to convince others of their point of view and bring them along. And that's a really great experience for perhaps those egos who could be shy and perhaps not so, um, not so confident to speak in public very quickly at Acton. They actually gain those skills, which are obviously critical for their future. And they also learn to articulate a point of view on life. And I think that's such a beautiful thing to see now with our middle schoolers. My oldest daughter is a middle schooler. And to see her form her own opinions and her own perspective, political and ethical and cultural, is just so fascinating. And I love it that she has her own unique perspective on life that unlike everybody else, anybody else. And I think that's thanks to Acton. Wonderful. Give us, can you give us an example of, you said, put yourself in the shoes of a, of a big decision maker. Give us an example of, of what kind, how would that play out? Yeah, I mean, I, I love history. And so the sort of launches that I do are often, you know, the great, the great leaders of history. So, you know, Julius Caesar crossing the Rubicon or not, and not an obvious decision, you know, <laughs> uh, the decisions of, you know, the Churchill had to take, uh, you know, go to war or not, not go to war, uh, you know, defend peace, uh, or, or, you know, how do you sort of handle these really complicated questions that today's leaders, uh, you know, still struggle with. Uh, and having the eagles put themselves in the shoes of previous generations, I think is also a really wonderful and immersive way to relate to history and relate to past generations in a really beautiful and intimate way, which is a big advantage. Wonderful, thank you. Those were some, some really great examples. How much interaction do you personally, because I know you have your, your job at Vivaldi, and how much um, personal interaction do you have with, the, with your acting school? Yeah, I mean, I like to be as involved, of course, as I can be. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, very involved in school. I think in the first year, I actually led art history, which I really enjoyed. So we did art history for us as we did art and took inspirations from great artists. And at the end of the day, the big takeaway um, our eagles told me is that art wasn't about how good you are technically at depicting something that is in nature, but much more at expressing what's inside your soul. And I loved it so much because much as we talk about not, you know, Alison Skopnik, not, not kind of having our children learn what humanity knows, but much rather exploring something that humanity doesn't yet and have them be those great discoverers. In the same way, art is a wonderful opportunity not to replicate what already exists in the world, but much more to express the very unique souls that our children have. Uh, and I think once they find that, it provides a wonderful outlet for their creativity. And of course, a beautiful way for them to also create something fantastic for the world. So every time we studied a great artist, it was always about what does this artist teach you about yourself? What have you learned about yourself that you didn't previously know? What's a new angle to look at your world and how do you create your own world the way this artist did? So that was really fun. Uh, I really enjoyed that. Uh, enjoyed doing the launches and uh, we also at Acton have a great program of field trips. 
Uh, oh, the first time over. Yeah, exactly. And so all the community comes together almost every weekend. And we've done some fantastic trips. We've done our first trip last year was learning to fly. So we went to a, a, a private airport and uh, all the eagles literally could sit down with a pilot who could walk them through how a, fly, how a plane works and literally take them in the sky and in some agencies even let them drive the plane, which was a great oh, wow. So that was a fascinating, very hands-on lesson in in uh, in science <laughs> uh -huh. and the of flying and then history again is very immersive for us so we go to wonderful places we went to washington crossing the delaware or you know various places where the great battles of the past or great events of the past took place so that uh, you know the eagles really have an opportunity to have a hands-on sense of how it was to live in previous generations and I think everybody loves that. So the, the field trips are always a big hit, but perhaps the best one was when they got to build their own little fairy house for the fairy trail. Everybody really enjoyed that. <laughs> oh, great. Oh, and how old is your youngest learner? My youngest learner is going to be two in two weeks. And so she is, of course, going to be ready for Spark Studio very soon. So we're getting ready to launch Spark Studio for her and other learners like her, little friends for her. So we're starting this year with uh, a K-Pod for kindergarten, okay. um, a, a small community. And then uh, the plan is to expand it into pre-K, of course, for which you will be ready in no time. Wonderful. And you have a Montessori guide for your for your Spark Studio? That's right. That's right. Yeah, Wonderful. We're, yeah, we're really in love with Montessori. That just works so well. Yeah. And of course, the act and philosophy is so rooted in Montessori, right? Yes. Most mm -hmm. of the principles truly come from Montessori. Um, and, uh, you know, really fascinating because to Maria Montessori, she called it the scientific approach because she came up with her principles by observing the children. So she always said that it's the only educational approach that actually is not rooted in an ideology because it's not rooted in some big idea or some belief on how, of how humans should learn. It is simply rooted in just observing how children do learn, which of course why it works so wonderfully for children and they thrive so well in it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I always say the same thing. How and have you seen, you know, there's a film, black and white, very old on YouTube called A Life Dedicated to the Children about Maria Montessori. It's like three and a half hours long. It's subtitled in Spanish and I speak Spanish. So I got, you know, I could understand it because it's in Italian, obviously, but watching that, have you seen that move, that film? I haven't seen that one, but I've read a lot of her works and a, a lot of us, just like a lot of us have acted, and I got my certification at, at Seton Montessori oh, as yeah. an assistant guide. So yeah, so really enjoy that path. Yeah, but the, if, you, if you get a chance, I mean, it's three and a half hours, but it's a wonderful documentary about her and her whole life and how heartbreaking her own personal situation was that I think, so many people don't know about her, the level of heroism she really had to display in her life and what a groundbreaker she was and her level of persistence and resilience throughout her life. Incredible. She's really a, uh, a model. Well, um, I think it's interesting because she made it work in really tough situation for children that had a lot of challenges. And then I think she and her son had the idea if it works in those situations, you know, why wouldn't it work just for everyone? Mm -hmm. And I think this is a little bit where action is today, right? We're crossing the chasm where if, if this approach and these tools that work so wonderfully for just a few learners, why can they be available for everyone? And I think that's what we are all saying. That's why families are flocking to schools such as yours and ours, because suddenly it's at this point when all these, all these ideas and approaches are becoming available to everyone, which is such a wonderful thing to see that the best of education can be really democratic and available to all those who want it. Definitely, such great news. So COVID, how are you all dealing with that? Such a challenge for families right now. I feel like every choice has so many downsides and just people don't know what to do. Such a hard time. How are you handling that? Yeah, no, I think it's so interesting because we were able to transition to a virtual environment fully. 
and let's hope that it doesn't happen again. But if it does, you know, we've tried it and it actually really worked. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where the principles of self-directed learning were so critical in making that a success because our learners know what they need to do, know what they want to do, and are not reliant on an adult to, to direct them. And I think that worked out so wonderfully because I could hear from so many other mothers that they have to literally sit there all day with their children to make them learn. And I didn't have to do any of it. Our children are self-directed and say no absolutely themselves. When do they have to do what? What's their program for the day? They design their goals themselves and then they track their progress according to these goals. And so they continued, you know, just moving at their pace. And the wonderful thing was how they supported each other as a community. And then they really continued collaborating with each other on Zoom, just as they would physically, and even to the point that they would have their lunch together and they would create some game times on house party and use some digital tools so that they could still get that sense of community. So I think it was really wonderful to see. Now in the fall, everyone's really looking forward to getting together in person. And I think that's really wonderful. And being a smaller community makes us a lot safer from a COVID perspective. So we will function as a pod so that uh, everyone is safe. And of course, as always at Acton, the community will come up with rules that make them feel comfortable that the environment is as safe as it can be for their children and for the parents involved. So that, that's the beauty, is that all the decisions have to be taken by the community. We also will spend a lot of time outside, uh, which again is very aligned with our philosophy. So we will use every opportunity to go to the forest, explore nature, and so of course science, you know, adventure, all of these things are very much part of the core of uh, who Acton is. Um, you know, they went uh, this spring, they actually got together at the end of the quarantine, they got together and got to build shelters in the forest. Oh, cool. And so I'm sure we can look forward to more building projects in the forest as well as hikes with all the families, of course, on the weekends as well. So that, that's our plan. Very nice. That's wonderful. Perhaps I could tell you how it's working out for various learners um, sure. in yeah. our community. Yeah. Yeah. So I told you the story of, uh, of my daughter who sort of started to become, you know, shy. Uh, to become shy and so now I can see her really coming back to who I know she really is her spunky outgoing self always with the best ideas and always doing creative projects uh, so I think that's really so wonderful to see that for her self-directed learning really speaks to how she learns best which is by making her own decisions and so how could I as a mother not support this it's so wonderful to see my daughter be a decision maker for her own life and also of course learn to be a leader uh, in groups as well. And for my son, he had the benefit of starting already at Acton uh, right after kindergarten and first grade. And so he is able to really advance at his own space. And because he moves so much faster through a lot of the material, he would have just finished third grade um, in traditional school, but he, throughout this year, he was already doing fifth grade work. So he's close to finalizing sort of fifth grade material in, uh, in, uh, in, in an Acton environment. And of course, we don't have grades, we have islands, mm -hmm. and our eagles can move from one island to another when they've mastered one island. Um, so, so I think he's sort of ready to move on to the next island pretty soon, uh, completing uh, what would be, you know, put him two years ahead of where he would be in traditional school. Uh, we also have, this is my own children, and I can see that all the other Acton Eagles who are a little like my children, they come to us and they say, my, ch my child doesn't like math. And now we see this wonderful, there's nothing better than to see that light in their eyes of learners who then say, oh, I actually found that I like math. Math can be fun, and I actually can be good at math. It's so wonderful to see the shift in them. And we had one particular learner who, at the end of last year, um, she was, you know, working on a particularly hard program, uh, math problem, and she wrote on her sheet, try, try again, fail, and learn more. Aww. And it was so beautiful to see the action ethic really, um, you know, reflected what, what, a, what a better, there, there can be no better way of seeing a learner thrive than in this particular instance where she was struggling with a, pro, with a problem and really did not give up and wanted to just continue sharpening her mind always further. I love that. And have you had any experience with families that it didn't work out for? And, and yeah. why? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really interesting because, um, you know, uh, 
action is a philosophy that is very aligned with the sort of choices that we make as parents and now as our children. So we are very, very respectful of the choices that everyone makes. So we are very open from the beginning that this is all dependent on how you want to see your children succeed and thrive and what you feel works best for them. So I think the sort of things uh, that we see not working out is really families who you know, feel that's not the choice they want to make. You know, we always explain to our children, you make your choices and these can be, some of these can be choices that work out for you and others do not. And it's really interesting because one of the struggles of action is truly to trust your children as a parent to make the right choices. I think if one does not trust their children, but wants to sort of solve all the problems for them, this would be a very difficult environment to be in. And we really do see that because, you know, ultimately, I think one of the hardest things to do as an acting parent is to truly believe together with Rousseau that our children are by nature wonderful learners, already have in them everything they need to learn and just need to uncover it. And so I think it really doesn't work so well if you feel that you need to teach your children everything and they do not know anything without us adults. Um, and with that kind of very traditional model, um, that, that's not really the ideal. And so I think when it doesn't work out, it's just purely a matter of choice, often philosophical choice on the part of the family. And we are extremely respectful of that. I see, I see. And um, <clears throat> yes, I hear you about trusting your child. Oh, like I think a lot of people say, yeah, I trust my child, like until they're making a decision that I don't agree with or uh, until it kicks, again, that fear in. Um, what advice do you have for your acting families and listeners, like when they, parents reach the point and they wanna kinda get in there and control, like how do you step back as yep. a parent? How do you manage that? I think that's a great question, Shannon. And two points on this. First, I find our family is actually extraordinarily open and self-reflective. So we often have families, even just uh, during this time, during this admission season, we had families come to us and just be very open and say, I love the model, but I just don't think I trust my child. And I think that's such an interesting observation. And then we say, thank you for being open about it. We think it's not the right fit for you. Yeah. Because ultimately, this will be a very difficult environment to see your child fail and make mistakes and learn from it. Uh, if you if you do not trust them in terms of the advice that I have for parents It's actually really I think hard advice because I appreciate very much Jeff Sanford's advice that The best thing you can do as an actin parent is unpush your own buttons. Yes, because I suspect that as a mother When we do not trust their children it is ultimately because we see a reflection of ourselves in them and somehow we perhaps do not want to see them make the mistakes that we've made and paid dearly for. So I appreciate Jeff's advice because I think the hardest thing we can do as parents is forgive ourselves for the mistakes that we've made. And just like we encourage our learners to be heroes who are on a hero's journey, really to see ourselves that way as well. And to consider our failures not as some fundamental failings of our personality, but really as opportunities to learn and grow as adults. Mm -hmm. And so I think if we're able to place ourselves in that frame of reference, then it becomes a lot easier to forgive ourselves. And then of course, do not see ourselves as uh, in the mistakes that our child makes, but see them as wonderful growth opportunities, because ultimately the reason we, we can be harsh with our children is because we are so harsh with ourselves. Yes, I love that. You put that so well. It really brings to mind Brene Brown's work and her, and then going back to how we talked about fight or flight or freeze and shame and that shame that we have inside of ourselves of like, I failed or I didn't do it right or I'm not perfect. And then that just gets projected onto our children. And yeah, the longer I'm in the acting model and just as the world goes on and now with COVID too of just really getting like my child's future has like nothing to do with me and yeah. I can't even conceive of it and actually my children know so much more about what they need than I can imagine knowing what they need right. and so 
it's like taking the hands off the steering wheel, which is a relief and also yep. thrilling and also terrifying. <laughs> so, I think you're so I, right. Yeah. And I love Renee Brown's thinking on vulnerability, right? The notion, which I think, again, just aligns with even the leadership philosophy that today a good leader has to be vulnerable because in order to, to learn, which is necessary to become better, we have to put ourselves out there and make risky choices and be open about the trade-offs we make and ultimately be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's also a really interesting challenge as a parent to not be the know-all and be-all, but be vulnerable in front of our children and role model how we can deal with challenges, role model how we can take risks and role model with how we can learn from our mistakes. And that seems to be almost a more interesting muscle to flex rather than imparting a specific wisdom or a specific technical skill that is soon forgotten or they would have learned in any case without us. But I know that can be really, really hard for parents who are stressed. And I think this is where having a community such as Acton is such a bonus because you are in this like-minded community of supportive families who are all kind of different but are all on a similar path mm -hmm. and share some similar values that they implement in different ways in their family so to have that support is is really wonderful so we have parent nights where families can come together and share their challenges if they feel like it and learn from others or just simply have some fun um, and I think for me it's been just a, an incredible journey um, the invitation to be an Acton parent is ultimately an invitation for us as well to learn and grow and also go on a hero's journey uh, and so I think to share this journey with our children has been just the most unbelievable uh, challenge and experience of all that's wonderful. Thank you. So the, the, at the owner's conference where your husband was, um, we, Jeff and Juan Mauricio Bonifaci, who started the Act in Guatemala, they did a Socratic discussion and they were, um, Jeff represented what he calls the Navy SEAL model yeah. of Acton, <laughs> and Juan Ma represented what he calls the family model. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I love to ask people, which model are you? <laughs> That's a really great question. Because when families come to see us, we always talk about the combination of rigor and joy. And we say about how other models can be, you know, can have rigor, the traditional models, uh, but not necessarily have any joy in learning. And others really are, are joyful, but also do not have the rigor. And so I think it's really interesting. So of course, all of us want to be at the combination of both. Uh, I think perhaps it comes down to the role as a mom and as a dad. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think that there is the warm, we also, the other way we put it is, uh, you know, the sort of the warm hearted and the cool headed aspects of, of action that truly make it very unique. So I think the cool headedness is the rigor and excellence, which I think is great news for those families who really are in that mindset of helping their children strive for excellence. And I think that there is the warm hearted nature that appeals to any mom who wants her child smile <laughs> and, and really be happy at school and enjoy going to school every day. Um, so I would say that our, our school is, is, is quite rigorous actually, but we achieve this rigor in, in a sort of, in a very supportive way. And in a way where it's the community of eagles truly, that truly decides on how high the standard should be and helps everyone rise to the standard. So I want to say if, if we are the Navy SEAL model, then the Eagles are really the Navy SEALs. And we as adults are truly the families that just can support them and, and kiss and hug them at the end of the day. Ah, oh, that's really sweet. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. And I think it's just such an interesting adventure just seeing these kids evolve. Uh, you know, from, you know, the unsure when they come to us and just seeing them thrive, the joy in their lives. That's just the most beautiful experience of all. Um, of course, including my own children being so happy and can't wait for school to come back, which is so wonderful to see uh, versus other kids who, who just don't want to go to school. Right. So, yeah. yeah. So I think I remembered. Yeah. 
college, university. Yeah. What do yeah. you like everyone, you know, university, what do you think with Austin? Yeah, no, great question. So a couple of points. First of all, I think the college market and the university market is of course changing so much as well. So I think that the model will be so entirely different when our children, you know, go there. And there is a lot of uh, acting like colleges already. There is much as we talk about my, uh, Acton being a micro school, there are also micro colleges as well. Tell us more. Uh, philosophy some names so people yeah no like there are some really fantastic uh, colleges um you know um, lots of them um that actually really cultivate the same model of learner centricity mm -hmm. and are really less into what we call knowing to know and also into uh, not just learning to know but also learning to to learn which mm -hmm. are those kind of study methodologies and study skills for uh, for the long term as well as learning to be which is ultimately helping uh, our eagles find a meaningful way to to live their lives so i think that model is is out there uh, but i think in addition really especially in higher ed increasingly when it's we don't just talk about learner centricity this fall when students go back learner centricity will be there the students will literally be in charge of their of their learning because there are so many models out there from the virtual model to the small group model to the hybrid model and the the learners have to literally take charge of their own learning so i think we cannot do anything better for today's learners in k-12 to um, than to prepare them for new for this new college world by putting them in charge of their education already right now because that is very much what they have to do uh, once they get to college and even to get into college they have to demonstrate things like leadership and initiative and a point of view on life all these things that act and helps them develop. Nice. Thank you. Okay. One last thing is um, I love the way you think and I hear so much of your, like your meta thinking and your, um, and that you have so many examples and metaphors. And I'm always sort of searching for metaphors to help parents to relate what's happening with the micro school movement and the big seismic changes in education for the future of their children. What meta, like, let's generate a couple of metaphors for where we are right now, if you could. Yeah. I mean, I think the industry metaphor that would come to mind is literally we are at that moment where we're crossing the chasm, you know, jumping across the big divide where all of these ideas become, you know, available like to everyone. the everybody. innovation and adoption curve. The innovation adoption curve. Yeah, I think that that certainly, uh, that certainly comes to mind. Okay. Uh, but I also think that the other, the other thing, perhaps the other helpful way to think about it is the transition from the, uh, the Fordian model. Uh, which is a kind of a, an industrial um, value creation model where everybody kind of has in a factory their own place and everybody has to do exactly the same time and meet metrics. Yeah. And it seems to me we still apply the same Victorian, Fordian industrial model to school, whereas in society at large, we've pretty much transitioned to post-industrial society. Mm -hmm. uh, and we call about the creative class and Anderson Horowitz um, talks about the passion economy, which in his recent blog, he talks about the notion that in tomorrow's workforce, if you don't have passion, you won't be able to succeed because ultimately your knowledge can only get you so far. It's always going to be about your ability to acquire new knowledge based on the learning skills that you have and your ability to have more ideas, work harder, convince others better, all of these things that passion actually enables. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that that's a nice way to think of it is the transition from the industrial model in school to mm -hmm. the creative class and the passion um, and the passion economy. But the one thing that is really important to me, and this is where I think the crossing the chasm uh, model comes in, is that these are really available to everyone in a democratic way uh, and that everyone can stand to benefit. And I would really love for all the children to thrive and become leaders and for every mother to be happy and to feel like her children are in a nurturing, safe, wonderfully supportive environment where they're loved and appreciated just for who they are and they don't need to fit in a box and try to become something that they're not, but rather can develop their unique skills and talents and find their calling. 
I love that. Thank you so much. And this has been a wonderful conversation with you. I've learned so much and um, I really feel a kindred, a kindred spirit with you. And um, thank you for being a, a fellow traveler on this journey to create a new um, type of education for our children and others. I really appreciate Thank this conversation. Thank you so much, Shannon. Really appreciate this conversation. It was so much fun sparring with you and dialogue to be continued. So I look forward to continuing Wonderful. the conversation. Wonderful. Take care. Say hi to Kai. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the New Schools Podcast. Tell a friend. Previous episodes and show notes, including any books or websites our guests recommend, can be found at thenewschools.com. If you're a parent who is looking for a new school for your family, send us a message. We would love to help. We can answer questions, share the resources we have, and help you get in touch with people in your area who are on the same path, determined to provide their kids with the best education. It's wildly important work. Thank you for doing it, and we'll see you next time.